good morning and welcome back again so in the morning we saw examples of the use of an array now another important use is to handle character strings string notice that we have not yet introduced string as a data type yet and that is because the programming language c does not provide for string as a data type directly instead it provides for a data type called char which stands for character unfortunately even the character data which is handled inside c is is actually somewhere between an integer and character and the c programming language very loosely distinguishes between integer and character as a matter of fact most of the characters are internally treated as integers since the character strings in c require the use of arrays so far we avoided the explicit discussion of strings and string handling however now equipped with the discussion on arrays we can see how arrays are utilized to handle character strings and therefore we introduce the character data type in c first of all the character constants how are the constants written in our program in our program the correct character constants are written as a single character within quotations so like what you see here so i have small a in a single quote please note this is different from writing a string i can write strings in my output operations and so on but we are now talking about data values so an individual character as a data value will have to be indicated like this so internally it is represented as an integer and uh, it occupies one byte in our storage which is the smallest addressable unit of memory now typically the representation of characters is done using an ascii code you are all familiar with ascii code but for our students we will have to tell them that it is one byte long and these are typical decimal values of the ascii code for some of the well known characters alphabets a to z capital a to capital z it is useful to tell them what backslash n stands for the new line character uh, whose value is 10 and of course then one can declare variables in a program of type char by saying uh, the keyword char instead of int or float and then describing as many variables as you want uh, as usual with numerical variables you can initialize character variables to character values please note and i repeat and you must repeatedly tell your students that these variables do not store strings each variable can store exactly one character and nothing else so therefore just like an integer in a float has a size limitation and any number value any value greater than that cannot be stored so it is here anything other than a single character cannot be stored here if i want to handle strings then i will necessarily have to use some kind of mechanism which will permit me to look at a set of characters as a single entity and we know that in, that that uh, feature is an array and therefore the traditional way of representing character strings not only in c but even in c++ because c++ uses extended features is to use a char array uh, you should also note that the c++ language permits string as a separate set of objects and has a huge object library to handle uh, strings there but as far as c is concerned you describe a char array as let's say employee first name 60 so this would be an array which can hold 60 bytes 60 individual characters however a peculiar feature of c arrays is that to determine how many characters are there in an actual string which is stored inside an array c uses a very funny notation at the end of an actual string it puts an null character so backslash 0 is a special character which is inserted at the end of a string consequently if you have a 60 element array it is perfectly possible for you to store a string with let's say only 17 characters in which case the 18th character will be a backslash null if you somehow get a string constant inside that array the backslash null will be inserted by c if however you are manipulating the array then it is your responsibility to ensure that at the end of any string you necessarily insert a backslash 0 this backslash 0 now is like a flag 
So, if you are examining what is the actual string inside an array, you keep looking at every character and the moment you encounter a backslash 0, you know that the character string has ended. So, here is an example. If I have a name with 60 elements, it can hold 59 characters. However, if I want to store the name of my friend Rajesh Mashruwala into this array, I cannot directly make this statement. That is not permitted in C because this is not a variable scenario. Instead, each location will have to be assigned a simple value corresponding to a character. So, I will have S name 0 containing R, S name 1 containing A and so on. And since there are 16 characters in this string including the blank to indicate that the string is finished, the 17th character will have to be inserted with a value backslash 0. Since backslash 0 or null value is the last element of an array in a representative string, such strings are called null terminated strings. Please note C provides absolutely uh, no protection against your messing up uh, the array. For example, if you have a 60 element array and you try to store 80 characters in it, C will not shout at you at all. It will quietly store the first 60 characters in the 60 elements. The 61st element will be stored in the next consecutive location. It will chew up your own program or some other data. So, you have to be extremely careful. The program must guard against such uh, uh, intrusions. Uh, I wanted to discuss uh, uh, other issues here. May I now go over to the quiz? So, let me demonstrate to you the, the use of clickers. So, here is a quiz. Uh, first of all, let me request uh, once again all the remote centers. I hope you have loaded the client software on the system and you have connected the hardware. I now request all participants to switch on their clickers by pressing the ST button. In case you already pressed the ST button some time ago, the clicker might dangerously just shut off before you answer. So, in such cases, press reset button and press ST button once again. I hope all of you have done that. Now, I will ask him to once again, let me just go through the, the quiz. It is very simple. We all know computers have memory to store instructions in data. This is a question about history, so do not be worried about giving wrong answers. Which technology was used in the earliest digital computer? The choices are A, magnetic core, B, electronic walls, C, semiconductor memory, D, cathode ray tube and E, none of these. We are setting the time to 2 minutes. Your time starts now. Uh, okay, this is over now. So, this is actually the clicker interface, these choices. Can you collect the, okay. We still have a problem with several centers, but the crosses that you see here are the centers from which the responses have been collected. Uh, I do not know whether you are familiar with what we are doing. Each remote center has a receiver which collects all the clicker responses there. Then we have a, a comprehensive uh, a layer of socket programs, a separate team led by Jayant Bansal had developed it. So, what happens is then all these responses come back here. So, even if you do not see a cross in one of the fields, it does not mean that the responses have not been collected. The mechanism that we adopt in such cases is asynchronous. At the end of the day, all responses collected during the day for all quizzes are collected together and a single file is FTP'd here and the same software then it can consolidate. So, teacher does get the feedback. In this case, we will see how much feedback you have got. So, can you view the responses? Just show the bar chart. Wow! I did not know that people have uh, uh, so many different types of, uh, I mean the, the people seem to be equidistributed in their, uh, uh, this is very remarkable. <laughs> so, let me, let me analyze this quiz because apart from historical significance, it is also important for our colleague teachers uh, to know the correct answer because some smart student may ask this question. So, I will repeat the question. The question actually relates to Manchester Mark I, which was the first digital computer to run a program. There were multiple computers being developed in US and UK. But the first one to actually run a program uh, was in England at that time. It was, I think, June of 1946. And that computer used the very funny kind of memory. So, let us look at the options again. Choice A said magnetic core. And 
not incorrectly many people have uh, shown that as an option because all of us know that the early computers used magnetic core as the memory. However, I am talking about 1946 and not 1955. So, magnetic core memory was not available then as a technology. Choice B says electronic walls and several people guess rightly that electronic walls was the technology used to build the digital circuits. So, maybe this was used in memory, but that is a that is not a correct answer because digital walls were never they were used to build the electronic circuits of the computers, but they were never used to build the computers memory. The third choice which actually has either the largest number or almost 50 percent number 50 people that is uh, say semiconductor memory uh, that choice is wrong and I would uh, remind our colleague teachers to remember that although they might be very young the time that we are talking about this semiconductor technology had not yet arrived in the world. So, there were no semiconductors and there was therefore, there was no semiconductor memory. There are about 12 people who believe that cathode ray tube was used. I do not know whether they have said this confidently because they actually know this is the right answer and incidentally this is the right answer or because they use the elimination technique in all multiple choice quizzes and they said that this could not be there, this could not be there, this could not be there and since Professor Fatak is asking the question none of this should not be there and therefore, they said this is this is the kind of smartness most of my students employ and that is why we hesitate in giving multiple choice quizzes in all of our courses. But anyway, the correct answer is cathode ray tube indeed. Those of you who have done electrical engineering would recognize that uh, uh, both the cathode ray tube and the notion of capacitance. So, the cathode ray tube used to display either a dot or a dash and whether it was a dot or, or a dash was detected by a, 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 a capacitance which was sort of measured just on the surface of the cathode ray tube and the memory had to be stable. That means, you, you should be able to say that I have stored 0 there and the 0 should be readable even after some time. It was only on a cathode ray tube that they could consistently keep by refreshing a display of either a dot or a dash. Anyway, I will not go to into those technology details. The objective here primarily was to confirm that yes, we are actually using this technology in a distributed fashion. So, with this I will say thank you to all my participants and thank you to all dignitaries. We are ready to continue with our uh, lecture here. So, let me go back to where we were. I was trying to tell you that arrays can be used to represent character strings in C and there is no concept of assigning a name or a string directly to an array. So, we must put individual characters inside a location. Further, since the string which is stored in this fashion is not a predefined data type, we cannot perform normal operations like assignment, comparison, concatenation, etcetera. So, therefore, we have to do something special just like we discussed the implementation of high precision numbers where we said we will have to implement operations ourselves uh, whether you want to add or subtract numbers. Similarly, strings represented in this artificial manner or a special manner, I would not say artificial because some similar way has to be found anyway, where null terminated strings will have to be handled by us, all such operations will have to be written by us. Consider this for example, I want to find out the length of the string which is stored in S name. Consider Raj Mashruwala was stored in that string S name, I do not know of course, what is uh, inside. So, how do I find out the length? Simple, I start looking at every character in sequence whenever I encounter backslash 0 which is a null, I know that there are no more characters and I complete my count. So, here is a small code written uh, to demonstrate how I can find out the length of a string. So, I say int i length for i equal to 0, s name i not equal to backslash 0, i plus plus, continue. Please notice that this continue statement merely means go ahead. Actually, even if I had not written continue, it would have continued automatically to execute uh, uh, this, uh, this particular block. There has to be some statement whenever I write it like this. Now, what it will do is it will start the loop with i equal to 0 
then examine zeroth element, first element, second element and so on. Every time it will check this condition. Is the ith element uh, not equal to backslash 0? That means, it is not null. It, that means, it is some other valid character. It will continue. Somewhere this condition will become untrue when actually it will encounter a null. When it encounters a null, at that point whatever is the value of i, those many characters are there. How? Because the i value is actually the, uh, indicator, the index of an element where the null is stored. But remember that we start with 0. Consider for example, s name 17 is null. I will be then 17. When I come out, I am assigning 17 to length and that is indeed correct. Because if s name 17th is null, that means there were valid characters still s name 16. But since it started with 0, the total number of valid characters in the string is still uh, 17, 0, 1, 2, 3 up to 16. So, this is the correct logic. This is how you would have to implement variety of functions. Fortunately, the C programming language permits us another standard library called string library. If we say hash include string dot h, then all those functions become available to us. I have listed some of the functions here. I do not want to go into the details of these at this juncture but you should experiment with the usage of these functions. For example, string copy permits you to copy a string into another one. String cat permits you to actually concatenate two strings. str is the, is the function which does what we just saw. Please notice therefore, that some of these functions are simple and even we can write the code for these functions. However, life is made easier if there is a standard library which permits us to use these functions. There are other functions, strcmp as the name suggests, it compares strings. The comparison is said to be lexicographic. Uh, the lexicographic comparison means that just as we say numerical comparison, we know 5 is greater than 4, 20 is greater than 19, etc. But when we have character string, how do we decide which character is greater than another character? So, as we know ASCII code defines numerical values for these and whichever is a higher code that is a higher value. The ordering of characters intrinsically defined by such standards is called lexicographic order. So, there is a lexicographic comparison and it compares two strings. If there is a, a string that is found, then it will, it will return a value which is less than 0 if one string is smaller, is 0 if both strings are same and positive otherwise. So, this is how you can compare two strings. str str actually searches a string inside of another string. str chr searches for a character inside a string. So, suppose there is a string in which you want to locate a comma because somebody has said that the string contains two values separated by a comma. Now, I want to separate out the characters belonging to first part and characters belonging to second part. I must search for that comma. I can do that search for comma by using str chr function. What it does is it searches for chr and returns a value which indicates the index of that given character inside the app. Name copy again does a similar copy so many count characters from st into s1. There are functions which actually examine individual characters and decide whether this character is numeric, alphabetic or whatever, whatever. So, these are like examination characters, you can say is alium, is alpha, is CNTRL, is digit. As the name would suggest, the first one will check whether the character being examined is alphanumeric or the character being examined is alphabetic. Similarly, it can test for lower case, upper case. Where exactly do we need to use these functions? In case we are writing an application which requires to extensively handle text. For example, somebody is building an editor or somebody is building a word processor. All of these things will have to be done always. Additionally, most compilers which have to look at your program as a text, they will have to do a lot of lexical analysis of the text that you input. Please remember the flexibility that you have. You can start writing comment at the end of any sentence. You can put one space or you can put five spaces. You can put a tab. 
all of this will have to be analyzed. You, you may put a number when you, you, uh, you may put a alphabetic character when you are supposed to put a number. So, within a number if you, if the compiler encounters a character z for example, mistakenly typed by you, you cannot expect the compiler to crash, but you expect compiler to say that the constant that you have typed in at this particular point line number so and so uh, is not a valid uh, numerical value which is required there. In order to say that what the compiler would do is that it will examine the entire line that you give and at a place where a value is expect numerical value is expected it will first examine every individual character whether it is numeric or not. If it is not numeric it will shout at you otherwise it will actually translate the value proper. All of these things. So, anybody any program which requires heavy handling of text in some form or the other would need to use these. So, there are these and many other functions and you have an extremely rich library uh, to handle character strings here. The next example that I want to consider is that of searching. Searching of values inside arrays and since such searches are very rapid in case the arrays are sorted, the accompanying problem of sorting arrays are considered extremely important in any information processing activity. It is important for scientific computations when you have very large values to handle. It is important for industries where you have to again handle very large number of records. So, sorting and searching forms a very special topic in computer programming. It is discussed in the first course, it is discussed in a course in algorithms, it is discussed in the course in data structures where special data structures which help uh, this sorting uh, could be handled. So, it is an important topic. All that we are trying to indicate at this stage is how a simple searching mechanism works. You will recall that I had discussed one particular problem that suppose not, not in the context of programming, but when I was defining the context of human interaction, where I had said that somebody has a newspaper in which the results are published and the roll numbers are given and their marks are given and that is in the increasing order of roll numbers. However, he wants his assistant to find out whether a student, certain student whom he knows has uh, how many marks that student has got. And suppose he gives to his assistant a list of these marks and roll number not in arranged in ascending order of roll number, but arranged in descending order of marks which is another way of sorting. After all I want to put the top performer at the first position then the next then the next and the lowest performer at the bottom. So, that is called merit list. So, suppose he gives a merit list and say find out whether this fellow is there or not. And we said in either case the assistant will have to go through each and every number to match it against the given roll number and find it out. So far, we had no mechanism to store a set of roll numbers or a set of marks conveniently. Array permits us to do that. Once I have an array therefore, I might choose to store a list of roll numbers in an array and the list of corresponding marks in another array. So, if I have an array with roll numbers and array with marks, I have read the data once and now that friend of mine says find out whether this particular roll number exists or not. So, how do I check whether a given roll number exists inside the array or not? That is the first question is a computational problem and more interesting problem is if this list is very big, how long it will take to do this checking and can I make it faster? So, let us look at a line of code which actually find marks.cpp I have named it. It is not a full program, it is just a segment. Uh, eventually, we will upload a full program onto uh, the website. This is not, uh, you, you do not need it today, so do not worry about it, but it will come on the Moodle eventually. So, let us see what uh, we are trying to sh uh, say here. Given a roll number, find the marks. And I am presuming that there are maybe up to 100 students. So, their roll numbers are stored in an array called roll, marks are to be stored in an array called marks n students represent the number of students. And I have decided to use additional variables here, given role should naturally represent the role number which is given by someone which he wants me to search. 
found marks obviously would be a variable which will contain the final marks corresponding to that given roll number. There is also a position which will probably indicate the position of that student not the merit position, position of that student local, uh, localized position of that student inside the array. So, if there are 100 elements whether it is the 53rd element which contains the given role or 25th etcetera, i is an index. With this explanation let us look at the algorithm itself, it is pretty simple. I have said read all the data in arrays. So, please note this program that is why it said it is a, it's a segment, it is not a full program. So, how will you actually read all the data? Very, very simple. You can set up an iteration, first read the value of n students, set up an iteration i equal to uh, 1, 0 to n students and in each iteration read a value of roll i and a value of marks i. That is simple as that. Once you have read all the values, then the program starts here. We want to find out the problem I restate. We want to find out whether a given roll number has passed the exam and how many marks that person has got. So, here is the code for it. I read the given roll number C in greater greater given roll. Now, I set up an iteration which will go over to all the existing elements of the roll number array. Please note the roll number array is defined to have 100 elements. However, the number of students whose data has been read is only n students. So, I will set up an iteration which will vary i from 0 to n students minus 1. Again, please remember in case of arrays, it is not only counting that I am doing, but my index expression will itself be formed by the variable that I use in my for statement. And therefore, invariably you will find that iterations which are controlled for moving or doing passes over array elements typically will begin with 0 and will end with n minus 1 if n is the total number of elements. As you can see here, the iteration is from i equal to 0 to i less than n students, which means the last value that I will take is n students minus 1, which will be actually the roll number of the last student. And of course, i plus plus is the standard increment at the end of the loop. What do I do within the loop? If ith roll number is given roll, given roll is a variable, somebody says find out marks for 1005. Now, roll number 1005, I do not know where it is. So, I will compare the given role with every element of role. Somewhere I will find that student. Whenever I find that student, I will take the corresponding marks. Roll i is equal to given roles. Therefore, marks i contains the marks of that student. Please understand that this is not explicit. C language or program or computer does not know it, but it is the way I have organized it. So, if I have two arrays, it is legitimate that I put data very carefully in corresponding location. Fifth location has a roll number, the fifth location and other array must have marks of the same student. There is no check on these things. It is my responsibility to do that. Having done that, I will say found marks is this. When I go through this entire iteration, when I come out, I would have got a value for found marks. All that I do is I print out marks for given role are found marks and then I will return 0. Some problems in this code, consider for example that I have found marks the second time itself. Now, unfortunately, even after I find the fellow and his marks, even if there are 100 students, this iteration will go through all 100 students. So, it does not matter whether I found that student's mark in the second or third or fourth position. So, it is a very wasteful algorithm. More dangerously, it is an algorithm which will get confused if I give that algorithm a roll number which does not exist in that set at all. This may happen for two reasons. Firstly, my list may have only marks of those who have passed the exam. And if my friend, that student with this given role is failed, there is no way I can find him or her there. More importantly, I may make a typing mistake while typing the roll number. So, I may have been given a correct roll number, I may type a wrong roll number and that roll number may not exist in the entire list of students. Consequently, it is possible that when this particular iteration runs on my computer, I will go through from i equal to 0 to n students minus 1, but I will never find roll i equal to given role and I will therefore never make this assignment. So, when I come out, what will happen? It will say C out marks for given role are found marks. What will happen? Well, I do not think we need to conduct a quiz on this. We all know by now 
that if a variable has not been assigned a value by us, the computer will take whatever trash exists in the location that was assigned found mark. The location was allocated to it at the beginning. Whatever is the value inside that location, uh, the computer will truthfully give you that value. Here is something I would like to additionally comment. If such a thing indeed happens, so you have given a roll number where you have made a typing mistake and then the computer runs through it, computer actually does not find it, but finds some location, some contents and prints it. Now suppose that location contains a value minus 25,000. This machine will, this program will print minus 25,000. And I will immediately know that there is an error because nobody will get minus 25,000 marks in an exam. However, suppose the value at that point in time happens to be 57 and the marks are out of 100 and 57 are legitimate pass marks, then this computer will print 57 and I may actually believe that this given roll number has got 57 marks. So I may tell his father or whosoever has come to inquire. Uh, that yes, uh, your son has passed, he has got 57 marks. Sadly, when the father goes back home and the son inquires in the college, the college principal tells him, no, you have failed, your marks do not exist there. That is the reason why the programs that we or our students write have to be so rigorously checked that such errors must not happen. What is the correct way of doing it? Well, I may put a found flag. I may set it to 0 and if I find a given role, I will set not only found marks equal to this, but I will say found flag equal to 1. After I come out, I will not output these marks for given role. I will say if found flag equal to 0, then see out, sorry the student has failed, else print given marks. So that is the kind of precaution that we must take. It is possible for me to artificially assign some negative value to found marks before this loop, that will also do because I can examine the value of found marks itself. If they are greater than equal to 0, then I will print them. But then there could be an exam which actually awards negative marks. Well, these are all considerations that one must apply while one designs an algorithm. I recall a friend of ours who asked the question, uh, what is top down approach? At the top, I think, is this generalized thinking identifying various issues in the problem, jotting them down. But top down is really not the name of it. This I would say systematic program design or program writing requires a lot of thinking first. In this connection, I would like to suggest one good thing to tell your students is that whenever you give them a problem, their first impulse is to start writing a program. One good advice to give them is for 10 minutes or 5 minutes, do not write anything at all. Do not open your pens. Just think in your head, then spend next 10 minutes in jotting down your thoughts on the paper. You must not write a single line of code till you have done that. What would you jot? You jot down the kind of variable names that you may use. You jot down the kind of strategies that you will follow. You think of what will happen if this is wrong, that is not correct. You list out all error conditions which you would like to check. Do this kind of thinking and then and only then start writing your code. Before beginning our discussions in this session, I would like to indicate what I originally started with saying, how do I do efficient search? Why do I need an efficient search? I can see that in this particular case, where the array is of 100 numbers, even a sequential search like that is rapid fire. After all, I have read the data. You type in the given roll number, you press the return key, believe me, even before you raise your head to see what is there on the screen, the result would have come. Because 100 comparisons, all 100 values stored in the memory is absolutely uh, no problem. You will immediately uh, get the result. But imagine if there are not 100, but 100,000 numbers. Imagine these 100,000 numbers are in an array, not in the computer's main memory, but as we shall see later when we discuss the file system, they are on the disk. Wherever they are, if you can do a search faster and reduce the number of operations that you do, you write a better program. So let us look at the algorithmic complexity of this particular approach. What is the size of my problem n? n 
is like the n students here. So, n students may be 5, 10, 100. If I have 10,000, I will declare of course, the array is to be 10,000 or whatever. So, n is the size of my problem. With respect to n, what is the expression I can write for the number of operations that are being performed? Well, I have an iteration which goes over n times. Within each iteration, I am making one comparison and in that iteration, I am making one assignment if I find that number. So, even suppose I do not make that assignment or I count it uh, whichever way, the maximum number of operations that are happening are n comparisons here. So, if the size of the problem is n, I am doing n comparisons, some assignment. Consequently, this algorithm is of order n. Remember yesterday we talked about an order n square algorithm. Clearly, an order n algorithm is much better. However, can we do something better? For example, if let us say the uh, exact expression which converts the execution time uh, uh, into an equation of the kind that we saw, uh, where let us say the order n means it is of the type k 1 n plus k 2. So, let us say k 1 is equal to 1 and k 2 is uh, 0 or negligible. That means, it takes n operations. Now, somehow if I can find the given element in half of n operation, I would have reduced the coefficient significantly. From 1, I would have made it half. Can I reduce the order? What is smaller than n? Notice that I mentioned earlier once that log n is smaller than n. Can I do the search of a given number in log n time rather than n time? The answer is yes and the answer relates to what we call binary search. I am not going to discuss the entire binary search, but I would like to spend 5 minutes in discussing a way which I have found with which people can actually relate to the binary search much more easily. There are examples that is normally given is search in the dictionary or search in a newspaper for results where roll numbers are ordered in the ascending order. In real life, our students do not relate to this as binary search. They eventually understand it, but please note that a student trying to read the meaning of a word from the dictionary will never ever exactly open the dictionary the middle. Similarly, a student trying to read the results from a long page, a large page in which large number of roll numbers are given knowing that they are in order, the student will actually glance a few numbers at the beginning and will roughly know where his roll number should lie. If his roll number is very high, the student will not go to the midpoint, but go towards the end of that list. The psychology of an individual therefore, is not exactly what mathematicians say. So, we say dictionary search, because it is similar to dictionary search, but not exactly like that. So, is there an example which actually can, where students can relate that example and say, ah, this is by the research. So, I have one example which I picked up from Professor Sony's uh, slides. I used it last year, it was quite useful. I would like to share that with you. This example for searching for a given value in the array is, I, I try to show it that it is similar to finding a root by bisection method. This is a numerical analysis uh, 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 function uh, method. What it does is that if you have a function, we are already familiar with finding out the root. So, the way we find out the root was earlier by making an initial guess and then making a closer approximation by drawing tangent to the function at respective point. The bisection method or midpoint method is completely different. It requires two guesses. It requires one guess which is on one side of the root and another guess which is on another side of the root. So, suppose this is the function and let us say this high is one guess and this low is another guess. The function value at low is negative, the function value at high is positive. Very obviously, it means that if it is a continuous function, somewhere it will cross x axis and as we know wherever it crosses x axis, that is the root of the equation. What does this method do? This method does something extremely simple and elegant. 
it identifies high, it identifies low. Now, what it does is, it finds out an arithmetic mean of the value high and low. Since low is the x coordinate of this point and high is the x coordinate of this point, effectively taking the average of high and low gives you a midpoint of these two and that is the reason it is called a bisection method. What am I bisecting? I am bisecting the range of values from low to high into two parts. The method actually most of you know it, but I will repeat this for the sake of completeness. What you do now is you examine the function value at midpoint. In the expand case, in the example case, the value of the function at midpoint is positive. The value at high was positive. What this means is that the root does not lie to the right of midpoint, but it lies to the left of midpoint. Because we know that at low, the function value is negative. At mid, the function value is positive. Therefore, the root must lie between these two. Notice that in a single operation, we have surgically removed half the space which we were to search. Imagine that we have to search from low to high. I am not examining individual points at this case, but that is what I will relate to in case of search error. Nevertheless, even in terms of real numbers or even in terms of I am searching so many points. This is the space I am searching. In one stroke, by taking the midpoint and examining what is the function value, I have got rid of half the search space. If incidentally the value of the function at midpoint was negative, I would have said yes, I have to search on this side. Since it is positive, I have to search on this side. And what do I do on the search? Nothing. Repeat. What do I repeat? I now set this to high. Now I have a new high low. This is like a new guess. I again calculate the midpoint, calculate the value. If it is positive, I have another uh, high or another low. Please note that the number of steps in which I can compress this space is logarithmic. Why? Imagine I had this total space, call it one unit. After the first hit, what is the space? Half. After the second midpoint, what is the space left to search? One fourth. Then one earth. So the space to be searched is decreasing very, very fast. And therefore, I can reach my conclusion very quickly about the value of the root. Okay, this is the bisection method. Why do I think that it is a very good example to illustrate to our students to motivate them for the binary search. So here is the some redrawing that I have done. This of course describes the bisection method. Incidentally, you might want to discuss this as a regular uh, numerical computational example in your class. So it says starts with a low and high value such that f of low into f of high is less than 1. All that it means is that function at high and function at low should have opposite value. That is why it should be negative. Multiplication should be negative. Otherwise, both of the function values at high are, are positive or negative, then that means there may not be any root in between. Now, it says compute the midpoint and compute the function value at midpoint. So, this is the midpoint and this is the function value at midpoint. While function value at midpoint is greater than some small threshold, absolute function value, locate the next interval to be either low to mid or mid to high. So, this actually explains the entire iterative logic. Keep on doing this. Find a midpoint, find out this. Find out whether it is the new range is low to mid or mid to high and reset mid accordingly. Then find out whether you have found out that function value is very close to 0. That is the meaning of this threshold checking. If it is not, repeat, repeat, repeat. This is the logic. Since I can compress my search space and I can reach my root in logarithmic time, if I map it onto my problem of doing a search, let me first define an equivalent. Instead of searching a real value which is the middle point, suppose I divide all of this into number of points. Let us say this is the desired root. Imagine for a moment that instead of looking at any real value on this, I will look at only these discrete points. So when I calculate a midpoint, I will go to the nearest discrete point. So my midpoints are the number of points are not infinite as will happen in a real x axis, but I am constraining it to be these points. But now my logic still works. So instead of going to an arbitrary real life, I will say these are the number of points I have. 
I will go to the middle point here. I will evaluate the function. Is the function positive at midpoint? Well, my, my search is still between this mid and this low. Now I will find out the midpoint of these many points. So suppose I had 1000 points to begin with. After one iteration, I have 500 points to search. After next iteration, I have 250 points to search. I have 125 points to search. The my number of searches to be made reduces very rapidly. And now I compare that with an array because the number of points on x axis in this illustration can be easily mapped mentally into number of elements in an array which I am searching. So either you take the roll number array which had 100 elements and make that roll number array lie flat and compare it with the, with the points that you have here, you have the similarity. What I have done is, I have done ulta. I have taken this and, and, and put it like this. And now I am saying, look, my problem was, I have this as the 0th element, first element, roll number 1001, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 11. These are the roll numbers and these are my marks. Instead of searching these roll numbers serially, which would be equivalent of doing a serial search onto these things, I now say if these are the points which correspond to an array, then just like a bisection search, can I not, instead of looking at it serially, go first to the midpoint, examine what is this value, consider that I am looking for 1002. The middle point equivalent to function value is the roll number. Roll number is 1004. 1004 is greater than 1002. Therefore, 1002 is on this side. If I am looking for a roll number 1010, then I know that 1004 is smaller than 1010 and therefore the roll number is on this side. So just like bisection method, I am actually partitioning my search space. Originally, I had seven numbers to search. Now I have three or four on either side, so half. So every time I reduce the number of elements to be searched into half and therefore the total number of searches I will have to do at most will be equal to log of n if n are the elements. And that is how I can reduce the order of my algorithm. Uh, people were asking, as, uh, how will you ever change the order? This is how. I do a completely different thinking and see how can re reduce the computations. So this is the program which does binary search. Uh, what I had written here is, I want you to implement this binary search in more than one ways, uh, small changes. And then when you ask your students, it is useful to give them such a sheet where the data is given here and where they are supposed to hand execute this algorithm to write down in the first iteration what was low, what was high, what is made. In next iteration what is low, what is high, what is made. Ask them to implement the same logic. This is one implementation. Okay. For example, if roll made greater than given roll, roll is towards upper half, high is equal to mid, etc., etc. People may make small squiggles. Ask people to solve that problem and execute this algorithm. If somebody comes up with two different schemes of binary search. They can't vary in principle because binary search is binary search. But they may vary in the future condition that you say. If the middle point is not an integer number, okay, you have for example, odd number of points in between. That is your range is say from 1 to 8. The average is 8 plus 1, 9 divided by 2. Average is 4.5. There is no 4.5th element in the array. So you will have to consider either fourth element or fifth element. Sky will not fall irrespective of which element you consider because binary search will encompass all other things any which way. However, this will be small difference. One algorithm may take fourth, one algorithm may take fifth. And depending upon that, the actual execution time behavior may slightly change. All that I am suggesting is it is worthwhile for you to actually ask students by showing them the slide that once you write your algorithm, hand execute this algorithm and write down these values yourself. What is the advantage? The advantage is that the understanding of how my computer program is executing instructions becomes much more clear by uh, this exercise. 
clearly this cannot be done if your array is 10,000 elements. But it can certainly be done and I think we should encourage people to do it. I myself do this exercise sometimes to ensure that my logic is correct. So I think it's a good habit. Well, this is the last thing that I wanted to uh, uh, sort of share with you as a formal example. Uh, I wanted to keep here 30 minutes for discussions, but we still have about uh, 25 minutes. Uh, so I will now open this for the discussions. Uh, any any question that you have, uh, you may you may please raise it now. Ejti I Matunga has a question. Uh, why time complexity for a for loop is less than that of while loop? I am not sure one can ever make that statement. Time complexity for for loop uh, has to be very similar to the time complexity of while loop. So there is in fact no complexity associated with a loop control structure. The time complexity is of the entire algorithm. There is a question from uh, NIT Nagpur. I can see you Nagpur. Over to you. Thank you very much. I will repeat the question for the benefit of my AVU users. AVU people are able to see that okay. The question is can every recursive solution be converted uh, to an iterative one and vice versa. Uh, frankly, I have never uh, uh, examined the possibility of somebody trying to convert an iterative solution into a recursive solution. Uh, a, a recursion formula may not be defined for every solution. However, the answer to first question is yes, a recursive solution can always be converted into an uh, iterative solution. Indeed, that is what we always recommend for the sake of efficiency. However, one must keep in mind that there are situations where the recursive solution is not only elegant, but it is extremely simple to specify and code, whereas the corresponding iterative solution will become extremely clumsy, extremely clumsy. Uh, a good example of this case. So, in a nutshell to repeat the answer, technically yes, I can convert a recursive solution and iterative solution, but in practice while I should try and follow iterative solution for the sake of efficiency, there are cases when the recursive solution is probably the best solution. One such case I think I had briefly mentioned, the tower of Hanoi problem. You may actually code it as an iterative solution, but the solution is extremely clumsy. Uh, you might want to attempt uh, writing both the, uh, both the recursive part and iterative part. Uh, there was one more question from uh, uh, VNIT Nagpur. Uh, uh, could I have the second question please? Over to you. Thank you very much Sumit, but I have one more request to make. While I could uh, clearly hear the question, I and my other colleagues could not see him because he was hidden behind the madam. I would like to go back to VNIT Nagpur for just one second requesting him to kindly stand up so that all of us can see you. Over to you. Yes, thank you. You are very visible now. Yeah. Thank you so much. I will now handle the question. The question was that uh, whether the memory uh, protection or uh, there was also a mention of dynamic allocation. First I would like to clarify, I do not know where I gave that impression. There is no dynamic allocation of memory to arrays that we declare. Arrays are fixed in size based on whatever size we declare them. You can actually cause the actual allocation to be done just at the runtime by doing a hash define and then doing an uh, array declare. Uh, dynamic memory allocation happens, but it is of a different kind altogether. Considering not only our character string arrays, but even other arrays where we have defined a size, if our index value is beyond the prescribed limits from 0 to that size, then what happens is indeterminate. So the correct answer to be given to our students is that if at all I am using an array, then it is my responsibility to ensure that in my program, I will never use an index expression 
whose value will be outside the bounds of that array. What happens if the array bound is exceeded becomes a question after postmortem. It is like saying that these, these, these were the uh, rules that were defined. Somebody did not follow the rule, so he died in a road accident. And now we are asking, well, how did he die? This postmortem is useful, but more important is to understand that rule number one is that I must ensure that my index expression does not cross the boundary and this rule must be followed period. Uh, you can introduce actually some checks. It is better to advise our students accordingly. So, in a nutshell, what we tell our students is that look, what happens if the bound is exceeded is a different question altogether. What may happen may be different depending upon different compilers or different systems. However, as a programmer, as a professional programmer, you should feel insulted if your program has not taken care of keeping the index value within the declared limits. I think that is a harsh answer, but that is a good answer. Uh, Triple IT Allahabad has a question. Over to you, Triple IT Allahabad. Thank you very much. I will first answer the second question. There seems to be some confusion about the index expression because earlier also one participant mentioned about dynamic memory allocation or something like that. So, first of all I would like to make clear that index expression is of course permitted and that is the way in which you access an element. Index expression evaluation has absolutely nothing to do with determination of the size of the array. So, index expression I repeat is not related to the size of the array. Size of the array is fixed once and for all when you declare the array in the statement int, float, char, wherever. So, if I have said int roll 500, then that array has a maximum size of 500 at any point in time. It cannot exceed that period. Now, I come to the index expression. When I want to refer to an element inside my program, like I was making a comparison is given role equal to role i, that i is an index expression. So, the purpose of the index expression is merely to say which particular element at this point in time I am looking at. It is in order to determine which particular element the index expression is evaluated. So, index expression is evaluated every time you make a reference r i, r j, r 5, in your program you might write it at many places. Every time you make a reference, so I will repeat again, such references have nothing to do with array size. Array size has been fixed at the top once and for all, int something 500, int something 100, that is array size. Now in my program, if given role equal to role i, that i is an index expression. It is in this context I will answer your question. Your question is, suppose the index expression contains two variables which are floating point is role x divided by y equal to something, where x is float and y is float. I will answer this question in two ways. First, what will actually happen? Actually happen is very simple. If you read my slide carefully, it will say it will evaluate the expression and the resulting integer value will be taken to be the index. So, if x, x by y is float, it will be converted to integer as per the rules of conversion of floating point value to integer value. So, we do not have to worry about round up, uh, round down, whatever, whatever. Whatever it does in regular expression evaluation, it will do it. Imagine as if you have that expression, instead of writing it inside the square brackets as a reference or index expression, you have written it separately in a uh, in an assignment statement. And the left hand side was an integer variable. So, if you have left hand side is equal to some integer equal to whatever expression you write. Now, the expression will result in a floating point number in case you have a floating point division or something. Ultimately, the compiler will generate instructions to convert this into an integer because it has to be assigned to an integer on the left hand side. Exactly the same thing will happen here. Which integer value it will take? It will take the same integer value as it would have taken had you done an assignment statement. So, in short, while you look at an index expression, look at it as if it is a right hand side expression of an assignment state. 
and what will it be replaced by for actual usage whatever would have been the integer value that would have been assigned in that assignment statement that is actually the value so i hope the second question is answered uh, adequately for you let me come back to the first question why why do the uh, uh, references in arrays start with zero and not with one as appears to be natural for us nobody has unfortunately documented this reason but uh, uh, kanigan and others who defined this language uh, in in some conversation they have admitted to widely held widely held view which is common sense is the purpose of starting with zero is let let me use a diagram to explain uh, it is interesting for people to uh, note this thing we'll actually discuss this later but i'm just showing it to you suppose this is an array now when we say the array has various elements stored in successive locations internally how are these locations addressed these are addressed using some numerical values so each location let us imagine we use decimal uh, notation so this location is 1000 this next location is 4 bytes away because 4 bytes are allocated let's say you have uh, assigned long int or integer to this so the next location address will be 1004 the next location address will be 1008 the next location address will be 1012 and so on now when the compiler generates the machine language instruction what it will have to do is suppose you want to access this element for some operation as indicated by your array reference let us say you have said if you are calling it 1 2 3 4 then this will be your fourth element in your array as per your terms the way the compiler would generate instructions to calculate this is it will take this base address and it will add a displacement to it such that it points correctly to this how will it calculate the displacement the displacement depends on two things one the difference between the values in addresses in two successive location so this is 4 bytes second it will depend upon the actual index value suppose it was 4 and you had a 4 byte thing it has to add to this 1000 4 minus 1 into 3 because 1000 itself is first element second element is 4 third element is 8 fourth element is 12 so this d will not be 12 but only Uh, we will have to be 12 and not 16 i hope you are getting me if it is fourth element then i have to say 1000 plus 4 bytes into 4 minus 1 imagine i am referring to let us say 18th element i i, I will write it here a18 for a18 the address will be 1000 plus 18 Uh, plus 4 what is this for this is the 4 bytes multiplied by 18 minus 1 so that will be the correct address of this location now here is the thing if i start with 0 instead of 1 then this a4 will become a3 a18 will become a17 and i won't have to do one subtraction which i am doing here in the days that we are talking about 1960s 1970s subtraction addition multiplication division anything that you could save meant a lot so if you had this indexing from 0 to something you can take the base address which the compiler has decided to allocate and simply multiply whatever index you have directly by 4 you don't have to to save one subtraction operation which was considered a big thing then people said it may be much easier to have my arrays index from 0 to something so as i said i i, I do not know whether this is the true and only reason but this is what i believe what prompted people to take this decision uh i hope this answers your second question uh let me go over to jec uh, jaipur kokas i can see you jaipur engineering college kokas over to you Uh, Yakun sir, so my question is why we are getting a different 
time complexity values every time if you are providing the same input to the program over to you sir uh, thank you very much uh, i i must first repeat what i said some time ago uh, please stop talking about these times as time complexity so what you are reducing or increasing is not time complexity time complexity of the algorithm is fixed once you write that program what we are doing is we are measuring the actual time required to run the program so let us call it execution time of the program and please do not confuse the execution time of the program with complexity i repeat again once i have written my program no matter where and how i run it and whatever execution time it takes the time complexity of that program is never going to be different because time complexity of the program is determined by the type of instructions that i have written in the program the type of controls i have so i will repeat again what we measure is execution time and let us be consistent we will talk only about execution time now i come to the question a very valid question his question is if he runs the same program many times and if he gives the same input then why does the program execution time differ from different time so once i run it i get say 14.3 seconds another time i run it i get 17.8 seconds third time i run it i get 25 seconds uh, let me confirm that this is the observation uh, over to you please confirm that this is the observation okay uh, so for the first time i just run the program i get the output that is a 13.27 and for the same input i get the uh, uh, i get the real time that is about 12.37 so if the input is same then why the real time or the user time of system is vary my question is this over to you sir thank you very much this is exactly what i guessed yes you are very right and i am glad you asked this question because many others would have observed the same thing but they have not raised this query his query is that every time he any time he runs a program with the same input once he gets 13 point some seconds another time he gets 12 point some second why should it differ at all let me give this answer this is a very good question so let me mention this what happens is whenever i am running a program on a computer that is not the only thing that that computer is doing even in case i have a single user machine that is it's a pc and i am sitting alone on that pc the operating system is running behind on that pc and the operating system has maybe 20 30 different small time programs which are running somebody looking at the desk somebody looking at something else whatever 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 there are programs which are automatically initiated for a short spurt by the operating system and that program may suddenly execute once when i am running the program another time it may not execute the situation is worse when i have a central server to which many machines are connected consider this there are 20 users connected to this server i give a command to run a program now this server depending upon how many users are active may allocate less time to me or may allocate more time to me consequently my timing will change so and the third uh, point is that the uh, the time utility of unix is not very accurate in fact if you read the documentation it very clearly says that you cannot guarantee accuracy of the time however i if so in less than 1 second you will not at all be able to measure however if there is no other load on the computer and how will you find that out you run you see the number of processes which are running if you list the processes you will find what are the programs that the operating system is running if there are a large number of processes running we cannot automatically find out which are active processes and which are waiting processes but if you have a time difference of a few seconds please learn to ignore it because that does not change your complexity or anything so if you want to test your test bed or test case itself should have a substantial amount of time in general any difference of less than half a minute would not be considered very meaningful and for that difference to be noted the size that you run the size of the problem that you run has to be much larger 
uh, although it is not pertinent in this case, but in the conventional benchmarks that we run uh, for large banking applications or something like that, it is not uncommon to run a representative workload <coughs> for something like 8 to 10 hours and then determine what is the average response time or what is the average throughput that you get. So thank you very much for asking this question. It's a very good question and a very good observation and this is my answer to it. Uh, thank you so much. My colleagues are reminding me that we are already overflowing with uh, uh, in our time schedule. Uh, we will meet tomorrow morning at 9.30 sharp. Thank you so much. Over and out.